Well, good afternoon, um, and thanks to those of you that stayed um, since the, the tall kit launch uh, of Tackling the Blues earlier on. Uh, delighted to, to welcome uh, Dr. Alex George, uh, a proper doctor, for those of us that have got doctorates or PhDs or professors, uh, professorships, and Youth Mental Health Ambassador to, to Edge Hill. Um, to coincide with the launch of the, the Tack and the Blues um, toolkit and delighted that lots of um, schools and other supporting partners are in the room um, for what will hopefully be uh, an interesting hour or so discussion around uh, mental health um, and all of the, uh, the various elements that connect to that. Um, for those of you that, that are not aware, I'm sure you are, Alex is the, uh, the Sunday Times best-selling uh, the author, sorry, of the Sunday Times best-selling book, um, Live Well Every Day, and his latest book, A Better Day, some of you have got it, I think, uh, here, uh, is out now in all good and bad bookshops, uh, yeah. as well as on Amazon. Um, and we'll come back to that, because um, one of the, the key messages um, that underpins that book, and that which we now use as part of, of Tackling the Blues, is the positive ways in which um, we can use evidence-based strategies to support our own mental health. And the conversation around mental health doesn't always necessarily have to be uh, a negative one, although, of course, there are elements of that. Most importantly, of course, we are talking uh, about mental health. And for some people, that might be, um, understandably, quite a sensitive um, subject personally or, or for other reasons. We will be sharing some various support uh, services and information um, throughout um, the next hour or so for people um, to use. And if you are in any way... Um, concerned or have any questions, please do come to, to see one of us at the end and we'll be more than happy um, to share uh, that support uh, for you uh, as we go through. But without further ado, uh, Alex, t tell us about your book. What, what's it about and why did you write it? Well, first of all, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for um, spending the next hour with us. It's going to be it's gonna be really brilliant. I love coming out to meet you all and talk to people who are, I guess, on the ground, living and breathing mental health that care and are so passionate about it. It's great to see so many people here, you know, who really care about this. And also, I want to say a huge thank you. You've got some of the team here from Tackling the Blues and yourself as well. It's, it, it's amazing and incredible because it makes a difference in people's lives. And... Um, it's changing the culture around mental health to see it more positively in the ways that we can build our own well-being and look after ourselves, and that is what matters. So can we first give a round of applause to everyone for, who was involved in Tackling the Blues? It's fantastic. It is fantastic. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. And actually, as well, uh, us doctors aren't actually real doctors. Uh, doctorates for, uh, for, for PhDs and so on. So actually, we stole the name doctor because they didn't know, know what to call us other than misters or bit butchers, really. So um, hopefully we've moved on from being butchers. I don't know. Depends where you go and get your help, I guess. Um, so I wrote this book. This is my second book. Um, and A Better Day, why did I write it? I wrote it as a book I wish I had um, growing up. Um, and I held that very firmly in my mind as I wrote that book because I think when I left school, I learned a lot about history, I learned a few things about maths, never really understood algebra, a tiny bit about physics and something about biology. But I didn't really understand how to look after myself fundamentally. And when I went to university and I was similar age to, to you guys, I went through a really, really bad time. I think I was in my fourth year and at med school and I went to Exeter in Plymouth. And when you're in that um, uh, medical school, you get kind of placed in hospitals around the place. And I was put down in Truro, which is kind of right down the coast, beautiful part of the world. But I didn't have friends or family down there. And I felt very quickly quite isolated. Um, and slowly, I started losing interest in studies. I stopped seeing friends. I didn't exercise. I didn't sleep well. My diet was terrible. And I felt worse and worse and worse and worse. And at the time, probably what I should have done is spoken to the university. But I thought, if I do that, they can be like, how can Alex be a doctor and struggle with mental health? And I was like, they'll kick me out. But I'd hold them back, they'll kick me out. I really, that's truly what I believe. And so I didn't speak to them. It probably gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Until the point where I felt really, really dreadful. I was like, I can't carry on like this. So I did what any sensible um, uh, university student would do. And I'd call my mum. And I said, mum, I don't feel great. Um, she's not a doctor. Her background is working in the bank. But I think she's very wise. Our mums are wise, aren't they? Who's got something, something good to say or something useful to say, I think. And she said, Alex, how would you feel good when you're not doing anything day to day that is actually conducive with, with, with feeling mentally well? And I was like, what do you mean? And she said, well, you, your sleep is all over the place. Um, you're sleeping in late. You're not getting a lot of sleep quality. You're eating rubbish food. You're not seeing any friends. You're not doing um, any movement at all. You're hardly getting any light. And you kind of lost your purpose. And I was like, gosh, this, that's so true. And so we worked together. We did a few things. We did thoughts of the day every evening. We talked about the negative thoughts that I was having. We kind of rationalized thoughts. It was almost a form of therapy, really. Um, I agreed a plan for exercise. I agreed a plan for my diet and cooking my own meals and feeding myself with good food. 
um, as much as a student budget would allow. Um, and I, I went for a walk every morning um, and, and also planned to see friends. So I, I did a few of these changes. And her oh, first week or so, I was like, I don't really feel any different. I'm mum, it's not working. I feel terrible. A few months down the line, and I was a completely different person. And even not just even subjectively in how I felt, but objectively even in my grades. And my grades were dropping off. Suddenly they picked up. I was engaged in the hospital again. People noticed the difference in me as a person. And there was two things I came away from that experience thinking. Number one is that I was a fourth-year medical student without a clue how to look after myself or understand the value in, in looking after myself. And secondly, the stigma is a really bad thing because I really didn't feel that I could speak to the university, and I never did. Even when I felt better, I never retrospectively thought, you know, I should talk to them or see what support's available. I felt a great degree of shame. And so years down the line, I'm going through the experiences that I have, and especially seeing how much we see of mental illness in A&E, I realized that you know, young people shouldn't get the stage of being 23 years old, clueless about how to look after themselves. And so what I put in this book is, is I think, the fundamentals that we should be leaving school with. And you know, we say it's age nine plus, but I've had so many adults message me saying, stop saying it's a children's book, because if you haven't learned about emotional literacy, if you haven't learned the fundamentals of some of the things we talk about, it's not a children's book, it's a book for, for everyone. And that's what, I've, that's what I hope it will be for people that, that read it. Yeah. How have you found the response to those fundamentals? I think one of the key features of the book is that it doesn't try to focus always on the negative side of mental health, the doom and gloom, which, which understandably is really important, but it provides practical strategies that people can use and adopt in the manner that you did. What's been the response to, mm. to people? Well, I think when, when you Google mental health, I, it, 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 re it always baffles me. If you Google mental health, you get pictures of people sat like this, and it's always in grey. For some reason, always photos of people under the bed in grey. I don't know who lives their lives in grayscale like that. And they're always negative, downbeat, miserable kind of views of mental health. You Google physical health, and it's Joe Wicks running through Central Park, the sun shining, and everything's beautiful. And I think that is such a shame. And that's why, you know, the colour, even the book with the colours of it. I mean, why does mental health have to be negative? You know, I, 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 have all of you got a pulse in you? I hope you have. You all, you're all kind of look alive to me-ish. Um, and, and so you've got physical health, right? And if you're sat here cognitive, again, by the end of the hour, I hope you all will be cognitive, um, you have mental health. And so it comes in all the shades, not just of grey, um, but all the kind of colours, and, 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 and there's a real beautiful side to, to mental health and, and the joy of life. And I think, you know, so much of, um, of this book really was about trying to change people's approach uh, to that and see that it's not just about illness, that there's, it's about positive health and empowering yourself to do what you love. You know, I, I have, I, I love Formula One uh, racing, and there's a Formula One car in the book, which is no surprise. And I, I love thinking about a race car with this analogy because people see Formula One and you know Lewis Hamilton's car as well, actually Red Bull this year, so Max Verstappen's car as the pinnacle of, of motor racing, and it's a high performance machine that travels around the track at, at, at almost the limits of what is possible on four wheels. And you think, well, how does it do that? It does that because you've got a team of people that think about the tires, the grip, the chassis, uh, the servicing of it, what goes into into the car in terms of fuel in terms of the driver, making sure they're absolutely prepared and rested, ready to race. So, so much thought goes into every small detail of that that allows it to be a high-performance machine. How can you expect to experience life and enjoy life, get the most of life, let alone being, be you know, successful when you do if you don't think about all those elements and the fundamentals of your health? We talk about mental health, but really, and we were talking about this before, the dream is that we just talk about health because physical health and mental health can't really truly be separated. If you affect one, positively or negatively, it will affect the other. I might use an example in a moment about that. But health as a whole, the fundamentals, you know, we need to all sleep and get reasonable quality sleep. And if you're going to change one thing to live longer and feel a bit happy, it's probably to sleep better. You make a lot better choice in your life. You're, able to, you're more likely to exercise, more likely to move, more likely to you know, um, feel better in yourself, uh, feed your body generally well, move, have a sense of purpose, get natural light, and have people around you that, that make you feel part of the community. And those are generally the kind of fundamental aspects. And they support not just your mental health, but your physical health. And I'd say I, I, I like this example because it's something that I saw over and over again in A&E. People often think that doctors see um, you know, car crashes, heart attacks, and so on. And that's absolutely true. But about one in three patients that we see present with a primary mental illness or something relating to mental illness. But even the stuff that is the heart attacks 
often there is a, a mental health cause behind it. There's a really good example I had um, that I saw, I stopped working at a about a year ago, but just before I stopped. Um, it was a gentleman in his 60s, and he came in with a heart attack, so he blocked one of his coronary arteries, you know, real you know, A&E physical thing to treat. So we gave him his medicines, we planned for him to go to the cath lab to have the artery um, unblocked and put a stent in to you know, get that heart going you know, healthy again. And you think, right, that's a physical issue. But when I actually spoke to the gentleman and got his history, he'd had diabetes for about 10 years, um, so he wasn't managing his sugar levels well. Um, dig back a bit further, and you find that he's, for about 15, 20 years, he'd been overeating, smoking, drinking too much alcohol, not, not moving very well, and living a very stressed life. And what, what I found speaking to this gentleman is that actually all of these behaviours had been because he was trying to deal with his job. He had a very, very stressful job, and his way of coping was all of the above. And you dig back and think, gosh, so it really was a mental health reason that all of these behaviours that were elicited, and therefore the end result was this artery being blocked. So if we'd have got in and taught this gentleman some of the stuff in this book and some of the stuff that really I think are fundamental to, to, for all of us to understand, maybe the coping mechanisms would be different and he wouldn't be in front of us. So a lot of the time, even physical things, you dig it down, you find that there's something related to the mind. And, and as I say, vice versa, you, know, you can't separate the two. If, you've, if you break your leg and you're unable to play the sport you love, like football, it's probably going to affect your mind, isn't it? So even a physical problem can affect this as well. The, the F1 example is really interesting. I think just over 18 months ago, just as COVID hit, for the first time, I think they begun to appoint a well-being um, set of doctors and managers that actually went on tour with mm. the drivers because of, and the teams because the vast majority of them had all the performance guys, all the sports science and, and all of the kind of engineers to deal with that. But not, no one actually spoke to the drivers or even the families of those guys or the guys who, who went on tour about what it was like to spend the vast majority of your time yeah, away. Yeah, of course. And actually, that really is, is part an important part that yeah. I think you're flagging your own. Not only around performance, a lot of us are interested in improving performance, whether it's in sport and other industries. But you can't compartmentalise that from the, the fundamental building blocks of performance. Mm. And in this case, it's good mental health. Um, and, and one of the other things I think you flagged in the book around the, the, the triggers, but also some of the benefits of mental health is social media. Um, there's lots of students in here. I know we've had this conversation. For those of you who are in my lectures, those of you who are at the back who are, well, you are awake. Yes, uh, students of mine would have been asleep. But um, it's social media. And, and understandably, a lot of the focus is on the negative mm. effects of social media, but in the book you make the case quite rightly that for a number of people that also opens up an opportunity to connect with others mm. and to share experience and so on. Mm. Kind of from, from your perspective as someone who's kind of in the public eye as it were, how do you manage your relationship mm. with social media and what have you learned in your role as, mm. as, as the ambassador about how that affects people's mental health more generally? Yeah, well, I mean, people often have the discussion of is social media good or, good or bad? The truth is it's both. You know, it is a tool, fundamentally, that humans use, and it's an ideal tool, tool as we use as connection, of uh, connectivity, of an ability to share messages, to um, you know, share uh, moments of your life with other people. But uh, undoubtedly, there's a negative side to it as well. I mean, things like toxic productivity, body image issues and so on. Bullying and trolling is a huge issue as well. Trolling is often talked about in terms of celebrities, but actually I think bullying online, if you go to you know, at schools, you speak to a lot of young people, I mean, it affects them hugely. You know, when I was younger, you might experience bullying in school. You get at home and you're safe, but now the bullying online is often worse. So those are the real negative sides, and they are there, but there are real, real positive sides to it as well. So people with mental illness, for example, might actually find, yes, it could be triggering, but also parts of it might be connecting with people that you feel a sense of um, that they understand you or you feel a belonging to. I mean, a good example is that I was, um, so if any of you follow me, you might have seen I was diagnosed with ADHD um, a few weeks ago, a month or so ago now. And, you know, I've been following pages that um, talk about their life experience with ADHD. And I've been learning so much, like, oh, my God, that's me, that's me, that's me. Oh, I'll try that and advice. So for me, personally, it has really, really helped me because I don't feel it's just me. You feel like there's connection. And all of a sudden, you follow this page and you meet this person. And I spoke to this person that saw that I had ADHD and said, well, you know, this is my experience. And we talked a bit about what I was going through. And so there's a real positive side to it as well. And I think the real question is not so much like, is it good or bad, or even should it exist or not? It's like, how 
do we harness the positive sides and try and mitigate or limit the negative sides to it? And yeah, I think part of it has to be legislation. I mean, the online harms bill is going through now. I don't think it will go far enough. Having said that, it is the first uh, legislation of its kind in the world. So it's a real starting point. And I do think the legislation and companies need to be held to, to account. I mean, um, we had, I started a, a campaign called Don't Face It Alone with num number 10 Downing Street and da the Downer Award, which is a really big anti-bullying charity. And we invited all the social media companies to uh, Downing Street um, Garden and stuff. And uh, it, was, it was really interesting to see some of their perspectives. And actually, you could tell that I think because of the way that tech has grown and how quick it's grown, a lot of people at the top don't have the answers. I mean, especially things like TikTok, who I've kind of, kind of tried to work with over the last couple of years and, the, and some of the things that they're displaying. They were learning on the, on, on, on the go, really. Um, and then they've got other platforms like Twitter that I, you know, I did give them quite a hard time, I must be honest, because I, I personally find Twitter very difficult to see some of the positives of. And that's my own personal experience other people find twitter brilliant for for news and so on but it can be a, a site that you know can create uh, real opposing opinions and sometimes quite a lot of hate on there so again going back to i guess where i started that point it's you have got to accept there are good and bad within social media so so what do we do about it and i think it's so important that you know as young people grow up now we realize and accept that most young people will have their jobs online in some format. Do whether you're a doctor, or whether you're at university, or whether you're a lecturer, whether you're whatever it is, you're going to have a component online. And even if not in your business, you're probably going to have in your personal life. So let's teach uh, young people the kind of um, how to use it effectively and positively, whether that's for your personal life or for your business or so on. But also teach people how to stay safe. Like you wouldn't get into a plane and fly a plane with no lessons, would you? You'd be quite silly to do that. But yet, you know, our phones are more powerful than the rocket that flew to the moon, and yet, like a 13-year-old will just have it and have the whole internet at their, their fingertips. So I think there has to be a little bit of realizing, like it's a powerful tool. Let's educate and protect. But even just understanding things like understanding how algorithms work and understanding that seeing pictures on social media of people doesn't mean that's how they actually look. And I'm a big believer that if you give, if you give young people the knowledge and treat them you know, with kind of real respect for their ability to understand, they will take on board these things and have that different, different view. You know? We were chatting just before you guys came in around uh, ADHD. Uh, and one of the... Um, sustainable exit points for, for Tucking the Blues. We're delighted that we'll, we'll be working on an ADHD and neurodiverse specific projects uh, as a result of the insight from Tucking the Blues over the last two years from January. And our colleagues at, at Everton and Tate and obviously other partners will, will contribute to that. And one of the key things that we found during the course of, of setting that up is just how little support there is mm. for people who have either diagnosed ADHD or undiagnosed yeah. ADHD. And actually not just the mental, but also the physical health costs of, of a system where we're waiting often for several years, particularly in this part of the country, for people to receive a diagnosis. Um, I mean, from your experience now, I mean, our earlier diagnosis mm. would have translated into more positive, productive yeah. behaviours, potentially, or...? Well, has anyone else here got ADHD? Is anyone having to? There's a few hands up here. Brilliant. Well, I mean, how, someone with, is anyone with their hands up happy to say how old they were when they were diagnosed? Recently, 41. So wait. Twenty nine, and I only found out about any form of mental health or anything last year. Yeah, yeah. I don't believe anyone else. Yeah, I mean, it's the, it. It's. I think the biggest reflection I have is that not that I have any. I don't. I have no issue. I am who I am, and I wouldn't change it at all. Because, like, um, it sounds like it's patronising, but it really wasn't meant that way. But the person who diagnosed me said, "For you, it really is a superpower because it allows me to do what I do." Like, I think you know, being in A and E, for example, is that environment that you jump from patient to patient. You've got a hyper focus to hyper focus and. There's a, I mean, I don't like the, the word ADHD, uh, the attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I think it's, um, I think it was created at a time where I think it was m quite misunderstood because actually, as a, with a, with attention and ADHD, you have an ability to really laser focus, but your length of focus is is different. So it's not really a deficit; it's a difference of focus. Uh, and and the idea of disorder depends on you, depends on your definition of order, of course, and what parameters you create. But the point that I have, I guess, and the feeling I have is that it's a shame that it's taken until my 30s to, to reflect that. So I've been through um, you know, primary school, secondary school, uh, university, and now in postgraduate 
study and doing a master's in mental health. And it's only now that I kind of understand those things. And in re reflecting, there's so many things that could have been done differently. And I think, you know, the world is hard enough as it is. Life is hard enough as it is. Why make it any harder than it needs to be? So even if some of the adjustments that could be made might make it 10% easier, that's so worthwhile. And also as a person, because you often try and fit into these boxes, don't you? You think, oh gosh, why can't I study in the way that everyone else can? Or why am I different to, to other people? And you're trying to conform, it's exhausting. Whereas now I'm like, well actually I only learn in like 10 minute chunks or I can focus on something really intensive a couple of hours and I'm really tired afterwards and that's fine. So I've become, I'm like relearning how to use the way my own brain is, and, and I think it's worked out fine for me. I mean, I, I, I'm fortunate to be in the position I am, but how many people out there are not sat in here with us who made it to university, who maybe just thought that they were stupid or too different or couldn't do it or were badly behaved or whatever? That's quite a shame, isn't it? You know, how many people we, we don't have present, I think, and I think we could do it differently. Earlier diagnosis, not waiting two years or three years. Some people, I, I pay privately, but people have to wait years sometimes make a huge difference, wouldn't it? And I think that's really part of the premise of, one, the project that we've been looking at uh, from Tackling the Blues to work with children and young people to understand the world as they see it and begin to identify what those coping strategies might be. But also, when you need to intervene, if we can intervene earlier, we can enable those young people or older people to have better fulfilling, more productive lives than having to wait several years, particularly, as we said, in, in Liverpool. And, and kind of the link between the clinical and the non-clinical spaces in communities is really key. And, and that, uh, Mike, who's uh, the deputy CEO from Everton, flagged this earlier, that one of the big developments at, uh, at Everton um, that we're working with is, is uh, the dedicated building of a space for mental health mm -hmm. for the people's place. Um, and we will, the, the Everton GP, the clinical GP, will work with us together with, with the guys on the programme to begin to identify early those young people that yeah. need support. If we can get young people into support earlier, they can begin to enjoy the types of benefits that you referred to earlier. But that needs to be replicated in other types of communities because otherwise, unless there's a su substantial change at the moment in mm. waiting lists and, and, and government approach, then, then lots of people will... Um, continue to, to enjoy those um, benefits, but, but perhaps not as much as they, they might have done. And I guess that learning and really ties into literacy. We were talking again earlier around one of the key things we hear about mental health is we need to talk more. But we can only talk more if we understand sometimes what we're trying to talk about. And one of the big challenges is, is around improving all of our own understanding of mental health and then being literate, literate about that. It's not enough just simply to be aware of of mental health, mental health literacy obviously is around behaviour, attitudes and changing things, doing things yeah. in a positive sense. That clearly applies to ADHD, but in your experience, how, how could we become more literate in a mental health sense yeah. so that we can begin to address some of the yeah. challenges that you refer to? Well, just to finish on, just on that ADHD point, point then, we'll, I think emotional literacy is really important. I think just to make that point, make a point around that is that mental illness is often linked with neurodevelopment, but the biggest aspect or the, I mean, one of the biggest factors and the reasons that there is that link is actually not so much that having ADHD means you're going to be mentally ill. It's more the process that you go through. So if you lived your childhood feeling you need to conform but struggling to do that, feeling lost, not feeling supported, or waiting till your late adulthood before people before you really understand yourself, you're going to probably be more likely to be anxious or depressed and so on. So I think it's not just helping people be more productive and, and be able to achieve things they want to. If you actually want to tackle mental illness, then help people understand themselves. So it's a double-edged thing. And, and, and I, think, I think that's really important to understand because if we support people and help them, say, with a diagnosis of ADHD, you might prevent a lot of mental illness and things like suicide. So that's an important point. The emotional literacy, I mean, what does it really mean? It's just kind of being able to um, understand your thoughts, your feelings, be able to not only recognise them, but verbalise them, and also have the person you're talking to understand. The communication is two-way, isn't it? It requires two parties to have a mutual understanding. So the person that's explaining how they feel and the person that's receiving that. I mean, if you look at behaviour, a uh, communication, sorry, 90% you know, of communication-ish, isn't it, is, is non-verbal. So much of it is how you sit, how you, your eye contact, your, you know, the way that you're being, the space, the energy that we give across. And therefore, so much of being able to um, recognise when people are struggling is like seeing those like, non-verbal signs. So emotional literacy is spoken, but it's also what's seen as well. You know, with children, um, often a child that struggles that doesn't, hasn't been taught 
uh, emotional literacy or struggles with emotional literacy will be behavior or bad behavior. So sometimes naughty children are actually the children that are just saying, like, I'm really struggling, I need help, or I don't understand myself, or, 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 or I don't understand how I'm feeling and how to vocalize that. So, you know, that's why I'm not really, I'm really kind of against um, have a heavy kind of punitive or punishment at schools or kind of you expel a child who's been behaving badly then what happens they go to a new place where they're less connected and less in touch with it or less able to maybe communicate how they what they're going through and it gets worse and worse so if we can teach emotional literacy for young age self-awareness allows you to identify issues earlier it might be able to be dealt with at the source but also then they can actually vocalize that and talk about that and if you look into adulthood i find it fascinating we talk about um, male mental health men are nine times more likely to take their own life and so much of that is actually i think quite obvious as to why that is the case when you grow up and when i was when i was younger you you were told if you tripped over and fell big boys don't cry grow some balls don't be a girl things like that um, there's loads of different words that would be used to basically say shut up and man up, effectively, right? And you, through your life, you expect, and society expects you to be a certain um, stereotypical type of man, and that's you know, being strong and tough and, and resilient. So you go through your whole life in society showing you both on screen, in magazines, in film, um, depicted on social media, as well as the way people communicate with you to be a certain way. And then we're surprised that when a 40-year-old man is really, really low and can hardly open the curtains to, get, to look outside in the morning, that they can't change everything that they've learned in their lives and say, do you know what? I feel really bad and dark and I want help. You know, it's, a, it's hard enough when you're in the darkest hours to ask for help if you have great emotional literacy, let alone if you've been, you've been basically developed in this person that's taught not to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and that is so important to understand when you're thinking about mental illness in this country because you can have a shiny, fantastic mental health service, but if men don't go and, and walk into your shiny doors, they, you won't be able to help them. And that is really, really, really important to understand. And that's one of the things that I really, you know, I talk about a lot at a government level is that, yes, of course, we want more funding. It needs to be targeted. It needs to be, the system needs to change. I don't think it works. I don't think just chucking millions at mental health services, well, actually billions, would solve the issue. We need to change the way we approach it. But we also have to teach at school and get people able to talk. We need to target Go to men, for example. If you want to try and target 40, 50-year-old men, don't try and get them in clinics. Set up, set up workshops or building or whatever it is or go and create football groups or do things that get men to come that don't make them feel that they're, that they're being asked to do something they just don't understand. One of the best mental health supports I heard was on the south coast. There was, um, I think it's called the workshop, and, um, and local men wanted to do something about male suicide. There's a huge spike of suicide in the area in the 40s and 50s. So they got a shed, and they built a workshop. I know it sounds very stereotypical, but they, what they did is said, right, every Wednesday we'll meet, we're going to build. We're going to build things for the community. We need a new park bench, we'll build it, guys. So we brought all men in to do it. They're all building. You had someone who had, a, one of them was trained as a counsellor, and they used that medium to get talking. You got men reconnected, they opened up a bit, they were doing things physical and building, it was help, helping their mental health, and they found it was a brilliant way to actually bridge that gap with them. So, so much of it is not just even just teaching about emotional literacy, it's like, what is the language we're using? How are we conversing? And how do we go to men and not expect men that are 40 or 50 that have been taught to be a certain way just to change everything and come to you. I mean, it was actually during COVID that we uh, at the university, again, with, with colleagues at, at Everton and uh, with, with a rugby league charity, begun to work across Cheshire and Merseyside with over 30-odd organisations, mm. suicide prevention for, for middle-aged men, and along came COVID, and then how do we do all of this? Mm. Um, and one of the, the, the key characteristics of all of those community programmes that were really, really diverse, from football to rugby to beekeeping, if there are any beekeepers in the room, to maritime, to walking groups. It was all because they were delivered where men were. Exactly. They were in, in local communities. Exactly. They were non-stigmatised. They were non-clinical. They weren't going to you unless they were in crisis. Yeah. And I think those key characteristics, and, and lots of colleagues uh, who are in the room work on these programmes, are essentially the, the key elements of what begins to drive that conversation around yeah. mental health. It, it is not always that clinical types of provision. I mean, we, we're talking at a significant scale as well. There's lots of, of men that would go to projects and colleagues from, from Everton will be familiar with this, others in rugby league that, that we work with. Over hundreds of men will go each week to football mm. clubs, to rugby clubs with poor mental health, but they won't through, walk through the door of an NHS service, no. either because they've had a bad experience or because they feel stigmatized. It doesn't just work for them in terms yeah. of their own experience. 
And I think it, for you as a, as, as a doctor and, you know, for working with children and young people, are those some of the things that you've begun, begun to see for men in terms of emotional literacy, mm. uh, ability to, to engage with others, and rather than just being a, a huge you know, systemic approach, always driven from the centre through hospital, but it's through communities where we can engage those people who are perhaps most vulnerable? I think, ta I mean, what we're really talking about is task sharing. Task sharing, uh, Professor Vikram Patel is like global genius on mental health, but actually his ideas are very fundamental. It's like stop trying to use um, you know, a professor in psychiatry as your only touch point for mental health support and thinking that that's going to work for everyone. Um, his idea essentially is that rather than ha training people, taking st loads of money and time to train a few people to provide a provision of care, rather than, the do, than do that is take the skills of the people in the community that are beneficial towards your goal, i.e. improving the mental health of that community, and utilise those. So one of the things I've asked the government to do, which I think we're very close, we were very close to funding with, um, with Boris Johnson, but kind of back to, back to the drawing board slightly now with the new um, leadership, and we have to kind of re-engage, is, is um, funding early support hubs. So we want myself and the rest of the kind of uh, mental health uh, coalition and the stakeholders want to see the government fund um, a support hub in every CCG initially. So there's 190 districts or health districts in, in England. We want to see a hub in every single one of those. And these hubs essentially would almost feel like cafe, a cafe vibe. There's a few charity-funded ones which have worked fantastically, one called um, Area, Area, of, Area 26, from Area 26 in Cardigan. Anyway, a support hub in Cardigan that's charity-funded. But, you know, essentially, it feels non-clinical. You bring in the skill sets of that area. So in Cardigan, they've got uh, local... Um, they've got canoeing, so local um, instructors who do canoeing. They've got, um, they've got uh, musicians who come and teach music. Uh, they, of course, have therapy and such there, so counsellors. They have yoga. They have all sorts of different skill sets they bring into the room. And this sits around a core of having youth workers who are there as a touch point, a regular, familiar, friendly, non-clinical, not your teacher, not your doctor, not your parent face who can support you. So in these hubs, essentially, we walk in support for under 25s. We target that group because we know those cover a lot of transitional points in life, the high-risk points, and actually points in which you can make a lifetime change in those people. So walk-in service for under um, 25s, uh, wraparound support, thinking about employ employment, thinking about supporting them if they need to apply for whatever it might be, university is helping support those young people, especially from challenged backgrounds that maybe don't have that infrastructure of support. And the cost of this would be... £190 million, pounds, that's a million pound per hub, which we've costed £10 million pound for quality improvement, essentially. And uh, you know, £200 million pounds might sound like a lot, might not, but if you compare that to the cost of mental illness in this country, it's an absolute, like, nothing. So last year, a mental illness cost the economy uh, £90 billion. Pounds. Um, the average uh, cost of a child being admitted to a mental health uh, ward is 250,000 per child, average stay, average admission. So it doesn't take very long to prevent at the sharp end uh, uh, those children being admitted before you pay for your hubs. I mean, there's intangible benefits and clear tangible ones. Um, and actually changing that model has a moral perspective, because why have we got systems where children are waiting two years to see mental health, get mental health support? How is that even a thing? Um, and there's clearly an economic uh, benefit and also benefit towards education. So s schools which have integrated uh, support about, for well-being and a whole school approach to well-being see better attendance, better behaviour, and often better results as well. So it just makes sense across the board, doesn't it, to shift away from that and come to ways like you know, for schools, to, uh, sorry, for young people, but also for adults as well. Like, let's move away from the clinical expensive side and actually get guys playing football again or you know, back together and then through that medium talking. In North London, sorry to go on about this, but in North London, um, uh, a young uh, Jewish male community were really worried about the amount of suicides they were having amongst that community um, in North London. Uh, I think uh, anti-Semitic crime has gone up by over 400% in the last 12 months alone. It's a really, it's really tough time. And they built up, they thought, how do we get men in here to talk? And they got funding from local businesses and they built a boxing gym. And um, it's free boxing as long as you do half an hour well-being class before. And they use that point to kind of teach positive well-being and also kind of signpost a bit to support. And the boxing, when they do the boxing, the coaches are trained to kind of spot when someone's struggling, so some of that emotional literacy stuff. And then getting them from that, A, getting them exercising and together, but also then getting them into counselling through that. So they managed to get so many people who are really struggling, wouldn't tell anyone they're struggling, into counselling through boxing.
Mm. So it's thinking of outside the box ideas, isn't it? Yeah, it's good that we're on the right lines. Uh, very particularly well. with the people's great, place. Brilliant. So if we're happy to, to spend that million pound if you want to pass that over. No. Uh, anyway, um, we'll uh, you'd never miss an opportunity to do. Um, <laughs> right now, what I'm really keen to do now is we'll, we'll hand over to, to the audience for some questions. We've already had um, a couple of questions sent in. So we'll, we'll do uh, those and then hopefully give you an opportunity to think of any questions that you, you'd like to ask on either what's been said so far or anything that you, you're particularly interested in. Um, the first question uh, is from... Uh, Kaylee, where is Kaylee? She, hello, former uh, student of ours. Uh, she actually asked two questions, as always. Really? She always asks two questions, <laughs> um, as always. Um, first one was thanks so much for raising awareness for mental health. It's it's so important. However, the, the next step is ensuring that young people can get the correct support. How will your role as a mental health ambassador help identify the gaps in services due to underfunding and feed, mm. feed into future plans to improve service accessibility? Mm. Well, look, I'm, I'm, you know I'm. I'm doing masters in mental health. I've worked at any. I've lived experience mental health, but I'm not a mental health expert, and I don't pr profess to be. Um, you know, my role really is to work with all the stakeholders, which vitally includes young people. And in fact, their voice is probably the least represented amongst Parliament and decision makers. So really, that's that's my role. You know, it is to go around and get kind of um, look at you know what are the problems and what are the solutions. So I'm trying to highlight kind of targeted. Smart goals, I guess, and, and I think you know, the reason I cho we chose the hubs is because we think this is a quick win is a very poor word to use, but it is something that is really tangible. It can be rolled out, and it can reach a lot of people. So the hubs, for example, would help half a million children per year in England. At the moment, there are about six hundred thousand children waiting to see CAMs, so mental health services, in this country. I'm not saying all those people can be had by the hubs, but you get the idea in terms of in terms of numbers. And I think it's really pressing and making sure that people, you know, that at the top that we're hammering on that door saying, you know, have you thought about this? What is the impact on young people? And what is the impact on people's mental health? I mean, it's a worrying... I feel, I feel really positive because I think we are in a snowball time where I think society, from businesses to, to, to universities, to colleges, to schools, to corporate environments, people are realising that this matters. Even the police forces... Um, uh, police forces are kind of realising how much mental health in not just their own force, but also what they're seeing on the street is affecting their ability to do their jobs, for example. I think that snowball effect is there, but the worry is at the moment, you know, we're going into a financial crisis. I think there was a hike in interest rates again today. And what I worry about is that the, one of the clearest indicators of a rise in suicide rates in the country is economic hardship. In fact, it is the strongest um, cause and effect that we have in terms of suicides. And that's a stark reality. So, you know, we, yeah, we have, to, we have to do more than we have. You know, part of the thing is that if you look at the history of it, we've got 30, 40 years of underfunding across actually 20 years, probably across the whole NHS, about 40, 50 years of underfunding across mental health services. So we've got to catch up. But I think it's about being targeted. If you chucked 20 billion, which is kind of the rough numbers they talk about catching up CAMs and, and adult mental health services to where it should be. I think clearly that would be great, but I don't think that would solve the issue um, it, because you also have to train staff. It takes a long time to train psychiatrists. Also, CAMs was just not a mental health, a community mental health services were built as a treatment-based model, not as an early prevention and intervention. So it wouldn't fix the issue. Mm. So it's not just money. We've got to rethink how we do it. Second question was, as a mental health team, uh, some parents have refused support for their children as they feel that mental health is a new trend or just you know, quite mm -hmm. sexy. Um, how do we find a balance between normalising difficult emotions in children and young people and encouraging those who, mm. who need support to get that support? Yeah, well, I, I, think, I think the fundamental of, of what we talked about already about mental health is that, you know, all emotions are important. It's important to be sad sometimes. If someone dies, it's sad. If you're not, it's not sad, that would be very strange. Um, if you're not nervous before an exam, it probably means you're not at all bothered about the exam. Most of us get nervous before an exam. It's normal to have these normal emotions, but if you've got the lever of anxiety and worry switched on all the time, that's not beneficial, it's not useful, and that is something you want to address. It doesn't mean that person necessarily has a, you know, carries a diagnosis for, for, for life. It doesn't really matter if you do or don't in many ways. It means you're going to focus and address uh, address it, but it's recognizing that actually I don't want to be anxious all the time. What can I do to kind of deal with that? Do I need to change the way that I approach exams? Is it thought processes? Is it other aspects of my well-being? So in many cases, even I don't agree that that, that uh, 
uh, having a diagnosis is a negative thing at all. I'm diagnosed anxiety. It doesn't, I, I make adaptions for that. It doesn't prevent me at all doing anything, to be honest. But uh, if you do have that view, then actually surely then it's even more important to, to teach people because then they prevent them, or you prevent them having or increase the likelihood that you can prevent that happening by understanding and normalizing things, but also recognize them. Something being normal, being anxious or nervous is, is, is fine, but as long as it doesn't come to the point where it's affecting your entire life, you know, and that's where that balance comes, doesn't it? Come on, one more question this time from Sophie, I think, over there. There she is. Um, yeah, what one change could the government uh, make that would, as always, what one change could the government make um, to have the, the biggest impact on, on public mental health and the mental health system more generally? Oof, that's a tough one, isn't it? That is really, really tough. Um, that is really tough. I, I think um, it depends whether we're looking at short term or long term. I think in in the long term, it would be to um, it would be to change the way we approach mental health teaching at schools. I think if we had an integrated system rather than a separated PHSE system, so you rather than having mental health tagged on the end, have it integrated across all school, a whole school approach and ed education. I think in the long term, that would give you the biggest bang for your, for, for your buck. In the immediate term, um, I think I think it probably would be the support hubs. That's why that I've asked them to do that because I think that we can't, you know, for people now that are suffering and struggling, changing the whole school system is not going to benefit these people that have left. So these hubs, I think, could provide that immediate support. So yeah. Okay, I think we've got Phil and Fiona running around, being healthy, um, for questions, and we've got a roving mic. Any? Uh, questions from the audience. Please put your hands up and then hopefully one of these guys will reach you. Have we got any, any questions? Hi, um, I'm a teacher and Hi. through the past few years we're noticing the number of pupils with mental health issues rise and the number of pupils taking time off school hmm. because of it or you know, failing to arrive to an exam or not doing their work. I was just wondering if further down the line you've got any plans to sort of help teachers feel more confident with supporting yeah. pupils while they're on waiting lists because a lot of them are on waiting lists, mm. but it's a long wait. Yeah, I mean, I, I, time and time again, I'm, first of all, thank you for what you do. I think I've, I've, I've just finished a school tour. I try and do blocks of these school tours, and I finished one a couple of weeks ago, or two weeks ago, going from London across to Wales. And I, I always just think teachers just do such an incredible job. It's so it is really, really one of the most challenging jobs. Amazing, rewarding, but hard at the same time. But unanimously, the thing I hear all the time, I ask teachers, what do you worry about? So, the mental health of my kids. You know, ultimately, I've not had one teacher yet and since I've been doing this have said I worry about their grades. Not a single one has said to me, I, I lie you know, awake at night worrying about their grades. It's about the health of that child. Um, and part of what is awful about having people waiting two years to see mental health support teams, not just the effect of, on that child, but also on the family, the friends, the teachers, the people around, um, around that person. So, I think a big part of it needs to be creating space on the curriculum um, for teaching young people about mental health, but also making sure we're actually giving the teachers their education. You can't just ask teachers to suddenly teach about something they've not been supported with. And we know that um, teachers' mental health is amongst the worst it's been for a very long time, which is probably not really um, that surprising. I think one of the exciting things that, that has started to be rolled out is the mental health support teams. Have you got one at your school? No, I actually work for an alternative provision yeah. school, so it's actually sort of private funded. Yeah. So we sort of miss out on all the Right. Things. So I think, so, so mental health support teams were as part of a green paper, 2018, I think it was, that they said they were going to roll out um, educational and psychological support teams in areas that work with groups of schools. And then those schools would have a mental health lead, so a teacher that was designated to be a mental health lead, and first aid, mental health first aid trained staff. And in schools that they have that system, it really makes a huge difference because there's time when that teacher's, whoever's the lead generally has that's their primary role in that school. Um, and then they will kind of set and help create that kind of whole school approach, think about the ways they can support the well-being, and also be that point of contact for a teacher who's worried about a child and is not sure and has other training um, to, to go to, but also for the child to go to as well. And then these support teams come to the school, not only just to do in terms of, right, you know, Billy's struggling to help Billy, but how can we change the, the system in the school to improve and make it most likely that the children um, uh, don't struggle? But yeah, I think, it, I think as precedence changes on, on how much we think about well-being, so will delivery of teaching. I mean, Wales, they've changed to a four-purpose approach. So um, what that basically means is that um, mental health is as important as maths, English, and so on. And that's really important because when um, 
Ofsted comes to knock on the doors and do their tick list on you guys, then, then it changes what they're looking for. And, and it's not like, right, how, what math, what about English, what about this? It's like, what about the, the well-being of young people? And I think that's really important. The money's got to follow it as well. You can't ask schools to provide more teaching on mental health without creating more teaching hours, more staff, can you? So, yeah. Thank you. Great question. Thanks. Well, I th certainly, the, the education and mental health practitioner role is really, really important. Mm. Um, the number of our students that have, have been through the Tackling the Blues program, or, or indeed through Edge, will go on to fulfil their roles. And one of the, they really, really are integral in beginning to change the yeah. culture around mental health, but also to support the, the mental health, not just for children, but also for teachers. Absolutely. And I think that's a key thing yeah. that we were talking about earlier yeah. from, the, from the program that, that we're yeah. here. Uh, for today, really, is about how do we support those who are supporting others, because the, the yeah. benefit for, for children and young people can only be maximised if people who are charged with supporting them are also mentally well and supported themselves. And I think it's a really important question that collectively we can begin to address because through the, the type of model that you've described and that we, we currently adopt. Um, so I think it's really important that we, we look not just at mainstream yeah. provision, but alternative provision or the types of provision, which have different challenges, but are nonetheless an important part of that, of that system. Any other questions? One in the middle. Um, Phil, can you crowd surf across there? Or? Are we in the middle? Just pass it along. <laughs> Why do you pass that on? The, the, I went to a school actually who had a mental health support team put in and we looked at like the stats and data and also the feedback from teachers and parents. We had like a big round table and attendance was up. Uh, the class behavior, they did like scoring systems looking at like how teachers felt it was and so on. And, and teachers were saying, I, I feel so much better having this. So it does work. Great, have we got it? Okay, far away. So, hi, uh, um, so we're current, I'm currently a counselling student right now, and I just had a question of like sort of what plans in the future you had in terms of like, sort of, obviously we know that the waiting lists are very long, mm. but the staff are also there, so how, so how can you push sort of, how, what are your plans to sort of get the people what they need in terms yeah. of not just the hubs or like them spaces mm. to sort of, like a sports or things like that, but actual sort of professional help yeah. from counsellors themselves. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for doing what you're doing. I'm I, I, obviously very grateful to everyone that kind of goes into work in that field. And, you know, I, I have my weekly counselling um, and it, it is so important to me. I'm very lucky to be able to do that, but it's, it's a huge... It's a huge benefit to, to my own mental health, I must say. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, we've got such a, they've got so many people out there that are either trained or training that are, can provide, you know, therapeutic benefits, you know, that are trained professionals. What we need is the money to kind of go behind that as well, because clearly, you know, most people aren't able to afford private, or certainly not for a, a period of time. Um, and I think part of it, one of the things I think, um, and this is kind of from an outside perspective, looking in on the way government works, is everything is in like blocks and it's like some it belongs to departments. So like Department of Education, Department of Health, and you realise that they're kind of the, the systems don't seem to talk to each other. And also, I think sometimes, well, like, that's their problem, or this is this is their, this is for them to do. Like, oh, um, well, Department of Education should pay for counselling for for schools, and they go, well, hang on, shouldn't it be Department of, of Health? And I think. Um, I think part of it has to be that we need to create a central area that these kind of decisions around funding are made. And I mean, we've got a minister for mental health but, but uh, that belongs to the health and social care. But again, the finger pointing goes elsewhere. And I found that being a challenge when I've talked to Department of Education around, you know, can we put pots of funding that's specifically for counselling for schools? And they go, well, it's health and social care. So I think part of it is creating like getting everyone on board to see that it's everyone's problem and then working how you allocate fun funding centrally towards that. But yeah, absolutely, there needs to be more mon money for those things. I think if you know, there's so many schools I've gone to that have full-time counsellors and that comes out of their budget for education, that comes out of other budgets, or if a school is lucky enough to have the ability to pay for that, it's funded, but many schools can't pay for a full-time counsellor out of budget. It's just not possible, and therefore the kids go without. Yeah, great. Any others? Yeah. Um, so would you say for like people would benefit from like a so obviously health and social care you have like the mm. multidisciplinary teams mm. so like how they're all interlinked so you're sort of trying to say that like we should have that but in sort of the government as well sort of not that 
obviously each department has their own responsibility, mm -hmm. but sort of they're all, they could all do with each mm -hmm. other. Well, I, I think that, uh, in my opinion, there should be a there should be a board, a group, a um, MDT that that sits and overarchingly has a view across all departments. So you don't have like it's your problem. I oh, know it's their problem. This back and forth. There's a view of like what do we do across the whole sector, um, to to be able to address this issue. Because fundamentally, what happens if I go right? Okay, I want the hubs funded. I got to argue between who 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 funds that. Is it health and social care budget or is it education budget? In the end, I actually did it through the Prime Minister. I thought, this is too much back and forth. So I said, go to the top and pitch to him. And then he says where it goes. Uh, and then he was gone a week later. So that was brilliant timing um, for me. Trust me, when you go, you're go, getting ready to pitch to a Prime Minister, you've got 10 advisors grilling you. Uh, and these are, you might, whatever your opinions of uh, Boris Johnson, he is not a stupid man, and neither is advisors. <laughs> He's uh, being grilled by them and then having to do a round table. Anyway, I'm not bitter about that at all. But um, I think it, it, it is so, it's so important to, to, to change how it works because basically, sorry, I, I lost my point. You go back and forth between the two, and then the, the department go, right, we think this is good. Okay, we'll take this on in education. And then you've got to go to a treasury for the money. Mm. So they hold that pot of money. So even when you've got someone to take ownership, you then still have to go to Treasury. So this needs to be a better way that there's a standalone system. Really, I thought that the Minister for Mental Health was supposed to be that cross view, but it isn't. They belong to health, and health go, it's their problem. My argument is, yeah, but if kids come out of school with this, it affects you in health, and health, um, sorry, in education, it's like, but if the kid's mental health's bad, they're not in school, and it affects teachers' mental health. So who owns it? I think there was a question at the back, wasn't there? And yeah, one at the back. Hello. Um, my point really is this. We always kind of go for something official. You know, you have to set something up to do that solves the problem, etc. Uh, and say, take the, the example of the lady who was talking about school teachers working and so forth. Children are in school for a few hours a day when it's not the weekend, when it's not the holidays, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So what I'm thinking of is the person who helped you mm. was your mother. Mm -hmm. So it's parents who may be the clue to a lot of things rather than rushing around setting something up or allocating huge amounts of money for this, that, and the other. How would you educate the parents mm. to help their children? Yeah, I mean, I think parents have to be part of the solution, but the, the, there's two sides of it. I think if we've, we've done a huge amount of polling um, amongst young people, mostly through the charity Young Minds, and finding out about where they want support and what support looks like. And fundamentally, kids don't want to talk to their parents a lot of the time. So, um, and, and, and there is a huge generational gap, um, especially when the kids are facing social media and parents maybe don't, haven't had that experience uh, of it. I do, however, absolutely agree that empowering parents has got to be part of that. So how do you, like my mum and dad, for example, you know, I lost my brother to suicide a few years ago. And my mum went, well, how, we, I wasn't taught how to spot things. How do I know how to see when someone's uh, struggling and so on? And I think, you know, it, it's hard for parents because if you're not given that emotional literacy or you're not able to be, to know what to do in that circumstance, where someone really is struggling, how you know how are you supposed to help? So, I think a big part of it is empowering them, and actually that's why I've had so many parents. I'm not saying this book. I'm not trying to say this book is a solution to everyone's tr troubles, but things like this and resources where they can learn to have that conversation are important. But I think having external support is vital. And you're right; they spend a few hours at school. So part of that system should be at school. But the support hubs, the idea is to catch the evening on weekends. Mm -hmm. You know, and most most of the time, most occasions where people take their own life, it isn't three o'clock in the afternoon. It is, uh, it, you know, out of hours and things. And that's part of the problem. In a lot of A and E's, we set up nine to five support hubs. Uh, well, nine to five cafes, mental health cafes. Uh, people tend to take their lives at three in the morning or whatever, not uh, you know two o'clock on a Tuesday. So, it you're right. It is how do we reach those people? children would be going to the parents. It's just the parents being aware. Mm. And I think we're now living in a world where people are aware. So you say ADHD, you don't almost have to explain what it is mm. to some extent. That It's very much in the air. Yeah. So it's really a question of how do you educate the general public and particularly the parents 
to be aware of what's going on, rather than, I'm not saying it's an alternative to yeah. pushing around, setting things up and giving yeah. huge amounts of money to X, Y, and Z, but it's certainly something that should be happening in parallel. Yeah, yeah I think you know, educational campaigns, things like anti-stigma campaigns, for, exa for example, and resource for parents. I mean, I often point people towards young, and like parents go, I'm worried about the child. Young, young minds have a tab for teachers, uh, for parents, and for students for that whole reason. Like, parent, they've got tabs, and you click on it, it goes, how to approach a difficult conversation when you're worried about a young person, what can you do to, to intervene? I, I mean, yeah, it, it, obviously parents have a huge opportunity to, to help. There's one just in the middle, Phil, and then the one more at the front, if we can. I think we will. Pass that oh, I've got one over here first, Andy, if that's Oh, correct. sorry, yeah, sorry. <laughs> As always, I was told by one of the programme staff, shut up, you know what you do. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Uh, Far away. So I used to volunteer with Tackling the Blues, and now I work as an educational mental health practitioner as Amazing. part of a mental health support team. Amazing, thank you. But we still see, like, because obviously we're trained in that low-level mm. early intervention, mm. But there's still like that gap between what we can then work with and then mm. suitability for CAMS, like yep. they're not meeting then that threshold and then they can yep. get. That's, to be honest, answer, that's where the hub sit. That's why we've modelled them in that way. Hubs will sit as your middle point. So where we've, we've got some charity ones set up at the moment, and they work with the CAM system. They look at the CAMS list and people that are waiting, and, and they have a weekly MDT and decide which children are better appropriate for support hubs and which ones will go to CAMS. CAMS is your kind of higher level, isn't it? You've got you kind of, um, your uh, mental health support team sit as your early intervention, vital in early intervention. Hubs will sit in the middle. They'll have psychologists, counsellors, therapists there, um, as well as trained youth workers to sit within that that that, that hub, if you like, and then above that will be your ability to reach CAMS. And a big part of the, the whole point, really, of, of bringing, you know, CAMS is not designed to deal with all the issues we're sending. You know, last year in England, 100,000 referrals to CAMS were rejected. That wasn't because uh, nurses and doctors in CAMS don't care about the people referred. It's because they weren't in the right place. So if we can reduce the burden on that waiting list, reduce the time, then the people that need the help, that not need the help, wrong word, that will benefit from the help that they can provide will reach it. Um, and then for other people, it's finding well, where is the best place for them to go. And that avoids situations where, and I've met many young people saying, I waited two years because I'm struggling with an eating disorder, but I was told I wasn't thin enough. And that still goes on. I know it goes on where people are told your BMI isn't low enough to be here, you're not sick enough. What happens? They go away, they get sicker, and then they're seen. Is that how you want the, tr the model to be? It is, it's not right. It's a great question. Though. Great. One more in the middle, Phil, and then one at the front, and then we'll probably have to end on Chris. We've already just over an hour. Um, I'm not on performance-related pay, by the way. You'd be pleased to know. Um, <laughs> Alex might be, I'm not. Um, OK, question. Uh, hi, I'm Danny. I'm here in the middle. <laughs> Sorry, I can see you with the, with the light. Okay. Is, yeah. um, I'm a student nurse here. Where are you? It's a weird um, thing. I can't see you. I, know, I can see you. <laughs> I did a placement on A&E, and the thing I noticed was people had come in with mental health cases, and they'd be so desperate to get out and then they'd come back again. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any plans for more support, like at the direct point in the hospitals, or if not, if there's any plans for it in the future or? I mean, there should be. <laughs> <laughs> there should be plans for it. There has been um, the big part of staffing issue. So um, the Royal College of Psychiatry have basically created, I think it was 2,000 more places to train more psychiatrists. Um, we need more mental health nurses as well, because part of it's money, but. I guess you know money equates more training potentially, but there's not enough staff a lot of the time. So staff retention in that field needs to be better. And you know, I, I, Claire, there's um, I, I call her my mental health mum, but Claire, Claire Murdoch is the head of mental health at the NHS, and she's been doing it for 40 years. She is one of the most incredible people I've ever met in my life. And there's a person I call if I'm really like I don't know what to do here. Can you help me? Um, and she's absolutely right. We have to create the mental health place to be somewhere that people aspire to work. I mean. It is amazing to help people. You know, you, the feeling of helping someone's mental health and knowing that you've saved their lives or changed their lives is so rewarding. But if we've got a space where we're constantly beating down cams or beating down mental health services or making it an unpleasant place to work, then we're not going to attract the people we want to attract. So, I, yeah, I think it, it, is, it is very tricky. And I think it's across the whole NHS. We're seeing it now on the physical side as well. We've got any doctors leaving nurses that are leaving the, the, the kind of sector. We need to start looking after these people, otherwise they're not going to look after the people that we want to care walking through 
the door. So yeah, we, we need we need more staff. Um, you know, some people wait. Um, I, I had um, a, um, a young person I admitted to Le uh, Lewisham Hospital a few years ago uh, who waited. I think it was 130 hours in A and E. Um, lights are on the whole time. There's no windows and there's noises and bells. If you weren't struggling with mental illness when you went in, you would be uh, when you when you leave. You know, so you know it's 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 a serious thing. Thank One you. more at the front, Phil. Yeah. I was just to pick up on what the gentleman said up there about parents. I understand what, what you meant, but as a teacher, we struggle if parents have got mental health, what happens? Because then they don't recognise yeah. what's going on. And we find, as teachers, that some parents mm. won't engage. And it could be because they've had difficulty mm. in schools with teachers. Mm. So it stems from their childhood that they won't come in and speak to us. And if they've got mental health problems, so what you're doing is great, mm. you know, to get the young people in because they might not have their parents like mm. you did, like some of us have. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So the point here is a very good point around, um, you know, what if the parents are struggling with mental illness and don't want to engage or don't know how to engage with it if their child's struggling? And I think that goes so back to that point. Really we need to have, basically, what you would build, like if you, it's like the Swiss cheese model, isn't it? You want to build as many opportunities to catch and help someone as you can, so reaching as many mediums as you can. Um, but we know that's, you know, we know that parents that struggle with mental illness, it's more like the children would because they grow up and live with that. And, Children are so like they like sponges, aren't they? And they absorb everything, not just what they hear in terms of words and language, but also the what's going on in the household. So, a big part of actually supporting children's mental health is supporting the adult mental health as well. Um, and and actually, the, the idea of the hubs, and keep going back to this because it's what I'm trying to live and breathe, came from Australia, and they they rolled out this system. It's been so successful they're now creating an adult version of the hubs. Uh, and we hope that will com they hope that it will complement the children's support because then you're supporting the parents and families. And import it's important it's separate because they face different issues, and it's very important for young people. We know one thing we know is that young people need to have um, a support service that is designed for young people, that's led by young people. They won't come if you make it into a family hub, if you like. That's one of the main reasons we don't have that because they won't come. Right. Final question, Chris. Just at the front, Phil. Fiona, you've let Phil do all the work, I've noticed. Sorry. That's okay. Are you all right? Whilst we get to that one, somebody with the microphone in the middle of the Right. Hi. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I'm also an education mental health practitioner. Um, I just wanted to kind of make a comment based on some people's questions. Um, one about, like, parent support. Um, and obviously, I'm part of, part of the mental health support team and aware that more need to be rolled out by the government. Um, but sort of our role is we go into schools and see children one-on-one -on -one for early intervention. So obviously they don't reach crisis point. Um, but then we also work with parents, like do parent workshops on, and work with staff on spotting the signs of early, early indicators of mental health. Um, so um, just to make, because I know some schools and teachers that aren't aware of mental health support teams, but it's a new initiative, but there is work that is being done, but more needs to be done. Yeah, I think it's, it, it's, it, that's that 360 uh, degree view. And that's the one bit of, so, it was, so they launched in 2018 and they've covered about 30% of the country now. When I came into my role, that was, the, that was like, so I volunteer in what I do, but that was my handshake was they, I got 80 million pounds towards the mental health support teams because that needs to speed up and that will increase the roll up by a third. But I want to, I want to see more, because at the moment I think we're looking for another five, six years till all schools have them in England. Uh, that's too slow at the moment, so, yeah. Did you say there's one more question? Yeah, one more, Chris, and then we'll... Uh, yeah, yeah, hi, my name is Chris. I'm from hi, a charity Chris. called Chasing the Stigma. Um, we run the Hub of Hope, which is the, the largest directory of, of mental health services in the country. Um, so that's, that's the plug. Um, <laughs> I talk, I, the Hub of Hope is the one charity I say to everyone, everywhere I go, I say, remember the Hub of Hope, there's one place that you can remember because you'll get your whole list of support from there. Oh, thank you. Really, really so there's plugs that. every every time I talk. Yeah, it's a big big part of that is, is getting exposure for it. Um, one thing we we have got in our favour with it being a digital platform is that we've got a huge amount of, of analytics that we mm. can see from the, the platform mm. in terms of how people are using it, what they're looking for, um, most importantly where the gaps are in provision. I mean, you mentioned earlier about you know mm. economic crisis. Yeah. We've seen a 28% spike in yeah. uh, the past five months of people looking for mental health support mm. related to to finance. Mm. Um, that's powerful, really powerful too, mm. for us to have conversations with decision makers and policy makers mm. around, around the country and commissioners. Um,
But often when we are talking to people in authority, with national governments or, or local governments or trusts, um, they, they often request our information, our analytics, but we don't always know how they're using it, and it seems very disjointed in, in mm -hmm. the strategy behind the use of data. So on that, I was just wondering how, within the networks you're, you're mixing mm -hmm. in and, and, and certainly the efforts you're making to, to create solutions in communities, how data is driving that, how it could be better used, and mm -hmm. certainly how, how data sharing could be more mm -hmm. coordinated. Well, I think it's just too disjointed. I think the biggest issue is that it, I think the whole point of having a mental health minister, wasn't it, to bring someone to have like a cohesive and like a overview, but it just feels like it's an overview within health and so, social care. And then I think, yeah, I don't, I don't think the left hand speaks to the right and that kind of use. I, I just feel like there's so many smaller conversations that happen in these departments rather than having like a bigger overview. And it's how do you change that? But I mean, so much of Parliament's so old fashioned, isn't it? I mean, we're all of us kind of frustrated at the moment with things that we're seeing happening. And I think this is this perspective. I mean, the amount of time it's taking me to try and get these hubs funded, I think they're, they're, there's no counter argument to these hubs. We've proved on every level that they are and, and you've got every, from the NHS agrees we should do it, the Royal College of Psychiatry agrees we should do it, the nurses agree, the teachers agree, uh, every, the young people agree, parents agree, and yet we're still not there yet of having that signed off. And it's been over two years of pushing for something that I think should have been like, you know, a month or something <laughs> looking at. So it's too slow. And sometimes by the time the, the data's looked at, it's almost outdated then, isn't it? There's a new set of data <laughs> that, that makes it... Um, you know, more important. So I think having, having, I, I think it needs to change and, and have an overview that because everything affects your physical health and your mental health, you need to have the ability to, to look across the whole of society and therefore the whole of government as well. It's a long and short. So, yeah, that's one of the biggest challenges I think we face. Thanks. I, we're going to have to um, draw it to a close now. I'm sure we could go on for several hours, um, but I'm really grateful for everyone's contributions. Um, from uh, the audience for questions. Uh, really grateful also to all of the partners um, that have supported Tackling the Blues, not just over the last two years, but um, since 2015. Particular thanks, of course, to Everton, the community, Tate Liverpool, um, Chasing the Stigma, to all of the schools, uh, young people. Um, particular thanks from Helen and myself for all of the staff, the students uh, that make all of this a success. And, of course, uh, I'm sure you'll uh, join me in acknowledging uh, the, the great conversation that... Um, Dr Alex has uh, had with us this afternoon and for all of the work that he does on behalf of the mental health sector behind the scenes. So thank you very much. Hope you have a safe day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you as well. Thank you.